This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 42 of the Wisdom by Wessa show on the Horse Radio Network. This is Mike Donnell. I'm Casey Wilbanks Coletti. And this is Sophia Aguilera. Welcome to Wisdom by Wessa on the Horse Radio Network. This podcast is brought to you by the Western and English Sales Association, WISA, which provides the world's largest trade events for retailers, manufacturers, and sales representatives of the equestrian industry. In this podcast, we feature exclusive interviews with noteworthy Western and English personalities, retailers, and exhibitors who you've always wanted to talk to. Don't miss out on all the news for manufacturers and retailers in the equine industry. Sophia joins us again today for our chat session, which is one of my favorite parts of the show. Sophia, thanks for being here. Yeah, a little bit of housekeeping as always. (laughs) Well, I know that normally uh, the WISA board meeting takes place in April. And as we know, uh, due to the worldwide pandemic, um, things are, are different for everybody. So, Uh, Just tell us what the board is doing since there is that stay-at-home order in place right now. Yes, everything is a little bit different for the board as well. There's two different meetings taking place over the phone, actually, instead of an in-person meeting. The first one was just for the EC, the executive committee, and the other was for the entire board. It was just important to the board to meet still during this time in some form or another just so their work continues. And of course, also the West staff can continue with the work um, to continue planning all the trade shows. And there will be another meeting, hopefully in person in June to resolve the rest of the discussion points. So that also means that people can still submit their questions or concerns directly to the board. Can you share with us the key topics for the board meeting? Yeah, so we cover all kinds of areas from past trade show performance and square footage to marketing projects and just things to do in the next half a year. But this time, the key topic was buyer incentives for Dallas for the first show at the DMC in 2021, as retailers can actually enjoy a lot of free perks at the first show. And yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, What is a board meeting insight that you can share? So I haven't been to a lot of meetings myself, but the biggest difference, I think, from the um, expectation to reality that people normally assume is that the board members spend a lot of time in these meetings. A lot of people just think that there's not much to discuss or it doesn't take a lot of time, but the members who volunteer for the time as a board member um, often sit in meetings multiple times a year for all day meetings. So it definitely takes a lot of time and they do vote in every single thing. Um, just for example, like the logo choice, which they have just voted um, for the West Trust logo, which is now available on West Trust Facebook page at West Trust Fund. Well, thank you so much. I, I know that we're all dealing with such uncertainty right now and all kind of navigating a a new normal uh, together. So I'm glad you were able to share and I'm glad we can all be here today and bring another great show. And hopefully that, um, you know, it brings some positiveness and um, a little relief to be able to still listen to the WISA podcast um, during this time. So thanks for, for joining again with great information, Sophia. Morris K & Sons is a family-operated company that has been in the fur business since 1936. The company provides products directly to the public as well as through specialty retailers. And our guest today, Joel K., is a fourth generation of the family to be involved in the business as a co-owner and as a designer. Hey, Joel, thanks a lot for calling us uh, from Dallas and joining us on the Wisdom by Wessa podcast. We're glad to have you. My pleasure. So what is going on new with the company these days? And then I also want to go back. I mean, you've been, your company, you're a fourth generation uh, member of the family. This company has kind of a long, I'm sure, colorful history. We'd like to touch a little on that. And then we'll circle back around to the present again. But give us just a quick update, especially with the current pandemic impact around the country. Uh, How are things in Dallas? 
uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, we're very fortunate that here in Dallas, unlike in the state of New York, uh, we only have about 1,200 cases of the virus that have been reported. We do have, you know, a few hundred deaths. Uh, but as far as, like, New York has 10 to 15,000 in one county, uh, thank God we're not at that stage. Uh, we are trying to reach out to our customers on the telephone and by emails to stay in touch with them, to check on them. Uh, Morris K. & Sons is a family business, and we take that very seriously. When our customers become one of our customers, they become part of our family. So we've been concentrating on reaching out to our older clients and just seeing how they're doing. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's go back to the 1930s when the company got started and kind of bring us, uh, uh, in a nutshell, bring us up to date to where we are now. Well, basically, we started off uh, as basic manufacturers of mink. Uh, my my father and grandparents back in the day didn't believe in carrying any other types of furs other than mink, sable, or lynx, something of the, and fox for the high-end persuasion. Um, unfortunately for me, my father passed away in 1984. And since then, my family, my sister, my brother, and I have taken our business in a different direction. So now we carry a more diverse uh, selection of merchandise. Uh, of course, like everyone else, we've turned some pieces that are actually imported to have a less expensive line to cater to a more, more people that are available to us. Um, we did start carrying rabbits a few years ago, and it seems to be working because, as you know, uh, the fur business is or has declined from back when it was in the day. We used to have 5,000 employees to pick from in the city of New York. And I think now the amount of workers that we can pick from is in the hundreds. So because of the decline in the want, want for the product, the longevity of the owners of the business, um, their kids have not picked it up like we did. So there's less furriers period for the world. Um, which is actually survival of the fittest, which is making uh, the people that are left actually stronger. So the companies that are still around today have adapted or have learned to adapt to what the new economy is interested in buying. Now, I noticed in the material that I read that uh, you had sent me, and I also looked on the website, your uh, distribution channel, if you will, uh, is both to specialty stores and direct to individuals. Is that correct? That is 100% correct. Okay. And how do uh, how does that work? Does it work with, uh, are, are, are your uh, personal customers kind of geographically close, or are they you and the stores uh all over. Well, basically, we, you know, many years ago, we expanded to WESA when it was in Denver about 21 years ago. So I picked up a new bunch of clients out of the mountain area. And of course, we've always been here at the Dallas Apparel Mart. And then we moved to the World Trade Center. And now, fortunately for us, WESA is moving to Dallas. So they're going to be in my home. And we're able to service more stores than we were before because of the move, number one. It's going to make it a lot easier for us. There's no way that I could bring all of my merchandise to my little showroom in Denver. I have a much bigger showroom, which is going to facilitate showing more items to all the customers. And as far as the retail business, you know, we opened a store in San Antonio, and my sister basically sells direct to the public out of San Antonio. Okay. The, um, I, I, I did notice, it, you, I, I'm going to assume, and I could be wrong, I'm going to assume there's no online sales? Uh, the people really, I mean, we do have some, but the people really want to try it on. They have to feel in touch. Our, our item is more of a touchy-feel kind of business. 
That's kind of what I would I, I would assume. And so what is the market like these days in terms of how you and other companies go to market and how has it differed over and I know you the, you're talking to Denver down into Texas. Is there other any other trends in terms of how the uh, fur product market uh, has been adapting to cur- to conditions and marketing product? Hundred uh, percent. The fur business in general has now been making less expensive product, also lighter weight product. As everyone knows, you can deny the global warming. But it's definitely been getting shorter winters, longer summers. We're making things that are lighter, knitted, more adaptable to wear longer, but not necessarily for only cold weather. While we're talking about your products, I want to ask specifically about some of your design inspirations. And also, I want you to speak about the timeless nature of your pieces. Uh, the design of our product basically is my sister and myself. We've been traveling around the world now for the last 20 years. We go to other fashion shows, not necessarily for the fur business, but in clothing. And if we see something that we like, we normally have a pattern that's similar. It gives us an idea. Maybe we can change the collar. We can change the sleeve. But truthfully, in in all honesty, the fur business, the garments that we make are meant to last. The garments last for 15 to 20 years. So we try to make something that's going to be somewhat contemporary, but yet will last for over 10 or 15 years at a time. Yeah. Well, I was talking to Mike earlier and I have a mink that was my great aunt's and it's still very beautiful and it's probably from 1940s, but pieces that um, have such value and meaning and can be passed down through the generations is something very unique that me as a consumer finds very unique about your products. And, and we started a recycle program. Basically, my sister named it the best this week. We take your family's heirloom fur and make it into an epic fur. Oh, my goodness. And what? explain that a little further. When you turn it into an epic fur, what are you meaning so exactly? We, we can take a garment that's been made, like you say, from the 40s and 50s, and we can now transform it into something that's contemporary. And the yeah. way we do that is we turn it into normally into a knit product, uh-huh. So we can we actually add yarn to it, 100% cotton yarn, mm-hmm. and we can design it into any type of style. And we can take wow. one full-length coat and make two garments. Sure. We can make a jacket and we can make a vest. We can make a shawl. We can make scarves. We can do a whole bunch of things that we never used to be able to do before the knitting came into effect. Mm. I love that. That is so valuable. Um, Before I throw it back to Mike, I just wanted to to touch with you on your direct relationship with WESA. And um, as you mentioned, you've been at Denver, you will be in Dallas. Um, Your your working relationship with WESA and the success that you've had in, in being at WESA. Well, truthfully, I've been working with, like I said, for 21 years with, with WESA. Amy took over from Tony High just a few years ago, maybe I think it's four or five years ago. We believe that they do believe in the best for the manufacturer and for the customers that they have, the exhibitors. They're trying constantly to think of new ways on how to bring customers to our shows. And and that's one of the reasons I believe they moved to Dallas. The show was a great show in January, but it just was lacking in September. And in order for everybody to survive, they brought us what we all hope to believe is a better environment to get more customers to our showrooms at two times a year rather than just one time a year. 
Well, that sounds like a uh, a great relationship, and I'm intrigued being a uh, uh, the fourth generation in the family. Uh, there are often people who are third and fourth generation in a family business, but they aren't hands-on in what that business does. It sounds to me as if you have a great deal of expertise in the fur, not only the business of the fur business, but in creating garments. And I'm wondering where that design background came from. Did they did the family teach it to you, or is it something that you just uh, knew from the beginning you would know how to design fur garments? Well, it's interesting that you asked that. We were talking about that the other day. I actually started going to the factory with my dad when I was eight years old. I worked from the ground up. I started from the menial, most menial task, and then I became in charge of production when I turned 19. We had a factory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I, I actually worked with all of the retired furriers, and I learned from the best craftsmen in the country. They taught me how to cut. They taught me how to sew. They taught me how to read a pattern. And then over the years, I've now perfected it. So I actually am a furrier. I'm not just a sales guy. I don't just sit in my office. I am the elf that's in the back actually creating the new fur. So for customers to come to Morris K. Morris K. and bring their garment, Joel K. is the one that's actually working on it. Well, that's a uh, that's an impressive level of involvement. Um, it's a, a clearly an interesting market. What can you predict, if anything, for the future, for the next, out of there, maybe a next generation, I don't know, but if there is, what's their market and their uh, business going to be like as different from yours or the generation before you? I believe that the, the hopefully my daughters will be coming with me. I believe that the challenges that they face will be similar to what we're changing, chasing, which is the, the more lightweight and making things at a, at a less expensive that people can afford to buy on an everyday basis. It's not only going to be a luxury item. We need for the regular people, the youth of the country, to be able to wear our product. Okay. Well, I hope your daughters go with you, and I hope they maybe they'll listen to this and they'll know exactly what, uh, what they can expect. Hey, listen, Joel, we thank you very much for spending time with us. Um, we talk to a lot of interesting people and find out a lot about businesses we didn't really know a lot about in terms of the inside workings. And clearly, uh, as it comes to your company and Morris K and you, uh, that holds true. And I think our listeners will find it fascinating. And thank you very much for having me. Show notes and links from today's show can be found at our website, wisdombyowessa.com. And, of course, we'd always like to have your feedback. There is a contact link on the website. The Wisdom by Wisa show will be published on the 15th and 30th of every month. You can listen on most of your favorite podcast players, and you can also listen on the Horse Radio Network app on your iOS or Android phone. You just search Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free, and it's super easy to use. Be sure to visit all the great shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Thanks for listening to the Wisdom by Wisa podcast. Wisa, where the industry meets. <laughs>